Hi. On June 5th and 6th, 2024, I'll be speaking at the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore, at the iconic Marina Bay Sands. Alongside brilliant minds like Benedict Evans, Balaji, and Edward Snowden, I'll be on stage exploring the extraordinary potential of AI and the profound change it represents, not just for financial markets, but for the world as we know it. With over 5,000 attendees and over 150 side events, Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June the 3rd to the 9th. Visit realvision.com forward slash super AI to register and join me with 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION, all in caps. Hi, I'm Ral Pal, and welcome to my show, The Journeyman, where I explore the nexus between macro, crypto, and the exponential age of technology. One of the things that I have really gone the rabbit down the rabbit hole on is NFTs. I mean, you can see many of my NFTs behind me. NFTs were the big buzz of 2021, particularly where things became very splashy. Many of you may have seen my Beeple interview, and if not, check it out on the YouTube channel on the Real Vision platform, where I really went down deep with people himself with Mike to talk about NFTs, what it means, why people got into it. But at the event at Mike's place, I met a lot of the great artists of the space. And I think it's very important to have conversations with them so we can understand that this is more than just speculation on monkey JPEGs. It's more than just PFPs. It's a new movement in art itself. Now, Art can be approached in many, many different ways. It can be approached for the sheer joy of art or its cultural relevance. I think of NFTs often as really a cultural capsule. It's a moment in time encapsulated on the blockchain that exists forever, that reminds us of the past, much like a painting is. But, you know, paintings can be destroyed. They can be lost. But NFTs don't because they're recorded on chain. And there's something really important that's happening here. And it's still small, kind of everybody knows each other, particularly at the center of the serious art world. And, that, and it's, it's fascinating. And the people around it I found incredibly interesting. As I've talked about before, you know, you sit around a table sharing a glass of wine and a few stories, and you're sitting around with artists, music people, fashion people, brands, finance people, technologists, all sharing this common passion for what is happening, particularly around NFTs, particularly around art. And I just find it incredible. I, I feel like we're at this special, magical moment in time, and it's probably not going to get repeated. You know, in 10 years' time, the space is going to be too big. People are going to be too impossible to connect with. But right now, we can kind of connect with everybody. And it's it's well, it's really lucky for me because I get to meet all of these people. And these are the kind of most important people in the space, the people breaking new boundaries. And I've really, really enjoyed learning more. You see, I think of art as the very top of the pyramid. And if you're just an investor and you have a passing interest in art, you'll soon get to realize the thing that I've realized is NFTs aren't just part of the crypto world, particularly the fine art NFTs. They're actually the pinnacle, the top of the pyramid. Because, you know, as the wealth in the space grows dramatically, as we go from 2 trillion to 10 trillion to 100 trillion, 200 trillion, the wealth in this space sure gets recycled into houses and Lambos or whatever. But in the end, a lot of it, goes into the art market, as it has in the traditional world. So if you think of the wealth of the 1960s and 70s and 80s, gets recycled into Warhols, for example. You know, we see a lot of this kind of stuff that happens. It's a way for people to remember the magic of those times and of their youths and of their lives. And I think we're going to see that dramatically play out in the NFT market, in the art market. I think we're going to see many of these early well-known artists who are groundbreaking 
who changed the rules or created the playing field suddenly become almost unbuyable over time. Now, this is not a quick process. We're not talking about making a quick buck. We're talking about a long-term asset that has real potential for a very long period of time. And so that's interesting from an investment perspective. And as I said, from a cultural perspective, I think it's really important too. We did, if you are interested in NFTs, we did a fabulous series called The Crypto Gathering on Real Vision. And day two was all about NFTs with some of the best artists in the space. You know, Beeple was there, OSF was there, whole bunch of people all talking about what it means to them, thinking about the physical world, the digital world, all sorts, all connecting. Uh, we had teachings to explain to you how to think about this. And I also did a kind of masterclass on how to think about NFTs from a macro perspective. Anyway, I think it's a really important part of the space. It's still kind of in the NFT sort of bear market phase. Things are moving. You know, we've just seen some very high um, price sales going on. But I think as wealth in the space gets created, as markets go to new all-time highs, we're going to see another resurgence of NFTs and particularly the art market. And we'll see some new groundbreaking artists that don't exist today. But, you know, as part of this series of The Journeyman, I want to take you down my journey of this too. And for some of you, you'd be like, well, why am I interested in this? I'm interested. And if you're interested in some of the things I'm interested in, you'll enjoy it. And, you know, I brought you Beeple, I brought you Grant Yuan, and I'm going to bring you Sam Spratt. And there'll be many more to come because I really think the stories that they tell are amazing. And they're amazing people as well really thoughtful because they actually saw that technology can enhance art. And that was groundbreaking in itself, how you can use AI in art, how you can use, you know, with Sam, it's about how you basically create old masters, but using digital tools. It's a kind of unique and incredible concept. And then he takes it one stage further and takes it into something that's so, so authentic to web three which is the connections and the networks and the gamification but in this gorgeous beautiful world that is also very deep and complex but also incredibly artistic anyway please enjoy my conversation with the fabulous artist sam spratt join me raul pal as i go on a journey of discovery through the macro crypto and exponential age landscapes in The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Sam, wonderful to have you on Real Vision. Thank you for having me, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. It was, we, we only met recently and we had a, a lovely time when we met and I thought it'd be a lovely chance to catch up with what you're doing because you know, you're a very important figure in the space. And there's a lot of complexity around what you're doing. And I think it'd be a, it's just a really nice story to tell. But as ever, let's go back in time. How the hell did you get into all of this in the first place? It's, uh, tell me it's a, a long story. and meandering me story. story. Yeah. The story's <laughs> always good. To, to give you as cliff notes of a version as possible, I always loved drawing. I was uh, doodling in all the margins of my notebook, throw it up, but never had really any ambition to become an artist. But uh, like most good artist stories, began with a love story and a girl that I was dating in high school wanted to become a fashion designer. I was not a very good student. I didn't have grand ambitions. So I let her ambitions become mine. I ended up going to art school. We did not last, uh, but I ended up in art school. I was at my very first drawing class and it was the first time I had really sat down and been truly like instructed you know, having someone who is an, an expert in their field uh, guide the technical process of drawing. And, you know, we were sitting in front of this still life of a bunch of paper bags and he was uh, just, you know, like voice of God in the clouds <laughs> narrating to, to the class that uh, you are not seeing paper bags in front of you. Do not look for the lines in them. Don't look for some kind of weird shape or anything like that light is coming in through those windows and it is bouncing across every single surface and every surface is just visible from that light. And 
taking in the world through uh, that vantage point and trying to recreate something in front of me put me on, I think the first time in my life I was obsessed about something. You know, I came into art school, bottom of my class, uh, because my motive to get there was, uh, let's say, a little awry. And I worked my way up. It was the first time I'd really been competitive in my life in any way, shape or form, or uh, been socialized in a fashion where I could like fail while trying to do something in front of people. And in art school, you critique each other, you kind of rip each other apart. And uh, I used that fire and uh, got some scholarships as we went further but along. wasn't that super intimidating? So when he says this to you, you're like, yeah. I kind of understand, but how do I represent that? I mean, how, how, does, how does that work? I think it's just, it, it's one of those things that could be bubbling up inside you your whole life, where if, if I reflect on growing up with my brothers and being out in Oregon and spending time in the woods, you know, fighting with sticks and building little forts, like I, w- I was always um, in my head. I, I was always uh, off looking at the world and trying to make sense of it in a way that I would say was not in a math class. That, that, that was not what fed me or gave me life. Uh, and so having something that sounds so vague and arbitrary, like everything is just reflected, refracted and reflected light and uh, now, now go, um, weirdly was the most direct instruction I think I had received up until that point in my life. The thing that resonated most with how I moved through this world. Uh, and so... Took it in, uh, worked my way up, got some scholarships, moved through, got out of school, didn't really know what to do with any of it. So I started applying for jobs because I, I, you know, I, I was trained initially pencil, then charcoal and then oil painting. And somewhere along the line in art school, I started picking up a digital pen and tablet. And I became very fascinated with the idea of taking these old master techniques that I had been studying, you know, Baroque era, Peter Paul Rubens, Jan van Eyck blazing in underpaintings and uh, the grisaille, the dead color of where you're kind of noting where blood flows just by way of how much warmth you're letting in from the undertones of the canvas. All of these bits were uh, foundational to me, but it also felt old in a way that was nostalgic. And I became very curious whether these new tools, a fairly like synthetic thing that is a black rectangular screen and a plastic pen could take that tactile, uh, that, that raw, that emotional, that texture that I, I grew up loving um, and, and translate it there. And so that became my next obsession. And as I got out of school, I applied for some jobs. And the very first one I got was a staff illustrator position for a tech blog, uh, you know, doing reviews of iPhone 3GS, that kind of thing. And <laughs> this is uh, the opposite of what you should be doing at this point, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, life meanders in funny ways. And at that stage, as a digital artist, I don't really know how you monetize this. I had, I had earned a, a craft, I guess, uh, some modicum of skill or talent at a very low level, mind you. Um, and so I got this job. I was there for about nine months, almost a year. Uh, and they paid me $20 in illustration. I eventually got a raise for $25 in illustration. I saved up a few thousand dollars and I moved to New York City mostly because that was like a thing artists were supposed to do. I, I, I mean, it, it was, it was almost like I followed a meme to get here, really. Like I didn't even understand the origin of it. Uh, what I was supposed to do once I got here, but nonetheless did it. And in that time, though they paid me very little, it was kind of early days in social media. So we're talking like Facebook, Tumblr, back when people use those things. And uh, I, I had my one like caveat, my one contractual, uh, I, I guess, coup was at the bottom of the articles that I would do an illustration and say, illustration by Sam Spratt, here's my website. And because it was a tech blog, it had a lot of readers in gaming, in film, in music. And those rather quick editorial graphics or illustrations and Photoshop jobs eventually started leading to real clients. And so I started turning that $20 job into a $200 job, to a $2,000 job, $20,000 job. 
And then I had about a 10 year arc of snowballing across, I would say pretty much every major commercial creative industry, music, film, games, theater, books, comics, doing everything from Marvel covers to working on Red Dead Redemption 2, doing album covers for Kid Cudi and Donald Glover. And uh, I, I really defined that chapter of my life almost entirely by... Did you, were you using a particular yeah. style at that point? Was it your style or were you just adaptive to the clients at that point? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question because I would say when I reflected on that 10-year period, period of time, I'd say there was maybe a sliding scale of 10 to 30% me. And then I was a chameleon. I was a mimic. I was uh, adapting. It was this like this for this. And uh, when you stack up 10 years of doing that, even though, hey, funded my life, snowballed into actually a relatively successful career, was able to eventually get a home here in New York from it. Um, there is also a, a weird, uh, almost like psychological toll, even for all the gratitude that you might have for something as silly as painting pictures and people letting you move through life and be able to support yourself and people around you is uh, I was not really there to be found in the majority of the body of the work that I did in those 10 years. Uh, so I got to hone my craft through them and through the clients and companies that I work with. Uh, that was, that went a long way. Like none, none of this exists without that. But the like slight ramification that eventually was like the straw that broke the camel's back when uh, other things in my life began, uh, let's say, unseating themselves and having to stare at my reflection of calling myself an artist. Uh, it, it, it was it was a little brutal awakening to realize I had um, considered myself that title even was successful on some metrics, but then my metrics were so wrong. In what way? They were purely clients, the names of those clients, and the money that they would give me. So how did you get out of that trap? I mean, I mean it wasn't a trap because you, you honed your craft. You learned a lot. You tried yeah. different things. But then how did you move on from that phase? Um, I broke, like, I, <laughs> just to, okay. to be, Fair to be totally frank, like I, I let it stack up for long enough that the moment, um, you know, when, when something is going well, even on a relative scale and you have enough people around you that are saying, you're doing a good job, keep going. And, and, and that kind of like creates this protective bubble around your mind where you can kind of continue to move, even if you are moving in a way that eventually becomes unchallenging. Uh, it has a odd way of keeping you stuck in, in a hamster wheel of your own creation, right? It, it's not anyone else's fault. It is like very much a self-created loop. Uh, and then... Because the story you you're living is different to the yeah. story you're telling yourself. And that dichotomy so. causes an enormous strain in the end because you feel like you're not being true to yourself, but you're telling yeah. yourself a story that's a false story and you know it is. It's kind of weird, right? Oh, it's you, you, you nailed it. And I think that very much everything that I've been focusing on since, but certainly what kind of unraveled the moment I experienced any modicum of, let's say, personal pain in my own life that uh, confronted this unraveling was I... We are dishonest narrators at times. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to reckon with that, that as you attempt to grow, as you attempt to move through life, most of it seems to be, at least at this point, getting out of your own way. <laughs> that uh, w whatever is a capital T version of truth for you to walk along, it is not being obscured to you by anyone else. It's mostly your responsibility to uncover it. And I think a good chunk of my life, uh, I let that protected bubble obscure it on my path. And when everything came uh, tumbling down, um, it was a beautiful opportunity to say, all right, well, I got 10 years of a career. I've saved up a bunch. I have the, the luxury of time 
where I can actually reflect right now. So all of that's not for not, right? Uh, and if anything, I actually owe quite a great deal, even to the clients that were the hardest or more, most soul sucking on an artistic level. They, they bought me that moment of whatever existential ennui, uh, that, that catalytic moment. And so then what did you do? So you, you had the epiphany, whether it came about in a bad way or a good way, but it comes about. So then how, how did you change? What did you decide to do? Mostly for me, the hardest part of being confronted with my last 10 years was the artistic side of things, right? It, it, it bled into relationships and friendships and all kinds of other things that are part of a common uh, behavior pattern. But mostly it was looking at that body of work and feeling uh, like I had blended myself in to fit into this various, uh, these various styles along the way. And I truly didn't really even know what do I, what do I look like? Which is in a very maddening existence as an artist, but probably for almost anyone, right? And, you know, if you're walking and moving through life and you are, disconnected from your own body, right? Like you don't feel your own blood pumping. You you are disconnected when you do this. You don't feel the tension in your fingertips. Um, it's a, you know, it's just kind of like a psychotic feeling. And so the immediate step was mostly use this opportunity to take this schism, this breaking point and extract the true emotion out of it. And in the process of trying to extract that true emotion out of it, I'm talking to a bunch of people and I'm talking to people after this violent moment in my own life, probably the most honestly that I ever had before, because at that point I'm like raw and melodramatic. And I, you know, I think what has occurred in my life is the worst thing in the world. And the, the most, uh, uh, beautiful experience is sharing these things with other people and those who have experienced, let's say, worse or have gone through it before you, uh, those that are, I'd say, like loving guides in your life, they don't mock your endeavor, but rather they help shine a light that, uh, okay, you've gotten here, you broke, great, keep going. And that, that sense of camaraderie of my experience is not special. There is nothing snowflakey about it. But it is, in fact, extremely important so long as I use it to refract and reflect the light, the people around me, that this was, this was the lesson that I needed to, to learn. And therefore, it is the thing that I needed to express in my work. I missed it. I'm going to start piecing my life back together bit by bit. I will share it along the way so that ideally... I do not create another bubble around myself because all the steps, it is not sitting on some perch mountain after 10 years of going away. It's here's my first attempt. Maybe it's this good one. Maybe I fuck up. Whatever I figure out from that, I'll learn. Here's the next step. And that's what Lucy is. It is an, and uh, this, this first chapter that I created that, uh, so was I that the first thing Christmas you did? The way. first thing you did was Lucy. And how come yes. you decided to use NFTs as a medium for this as well? Talk me through that whole process. You know, it, there are some things that I can only describe as there is a cultural emotion all occurring at the same time. And I think what led me to doing it this way is the same that led a lot of people to this space, which is many had a form of success in their prior path in life that was not wholly disconnected from what they are doing within crypto or NFTs, but that they felt a certain degree of decay, like they had bumped up against the limits of something that they knew they had enough foresight to see was in the process of dying. And they didn't want to go down with the ship. And they were curious, even if this wasn't the definitive path to take into the future, to at least there was something new being created here and, and a deep curiosity for it. And for me, one of the things that was most compelling about it, after having a life that was largely defined by, it was me, the artist, the source, the client, and I guess the viewer, the destination. But there was also a music label or an ad agency. 
there was these filters between those things. And I had never in my life really created without that filter. And the very concept, uh, which is a very old concept in art of the artist and the patron with digital art, that didn't really exist before. Uh, at least not in a way that I had bumped up in, in now coming a little closer to the traditional art world. It does exist, but it is quieter and it is certainly less as accessible as what the blockchain has enabled. And so the concept of being able to just dump out exactly who I am, care not one bit about what anyone else thinks about this. This is a time in my life to be reflective, to exert, to extract. And really only one other person in the whole world needs to mess with it. Like there just has to be one other soul in the entire world that is on a similar frequency as I am that can see what I'm trying to get out there. And I think that that process for me as an artist was uh, utterly life-changing because it just showed me that um, nothing needs to be in my way to create the work itself, but that at the end of the day, you really just need a few people in your life to believe in you instead of trying to make something for everyone. It's fascinating because you and um, Mike Beeple have gone through a very similar thing, You're both commercial artists, and then suddenly blockchain comes along and it's like, oh, okay, now I've got something I can actually work with. And it completely pivoted your existence and gave you an, a new opportunity. So, So how did you first hear about all of this? How did you first hear about NFTs? How did it come into your realm of understanding? And then kind of how did you think, okay, I'm actually going to do something bigger with this and, you know, the storytelling. I just want to hear that whole process of 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 how you started on this journey. I had started developing Lucy back in early 2019. Uh, and, and at that point, it was... Uh, I would say fairly ugly and it was uh, not the version of it that eventually made its way through, but I was just ideating. I was just using that kind of moment of quiet in my life to try to make something that I, I felt any sense of pride in at all. And uh, I would say partway through that year, I became familiar with, I would say like the first crop of artists, right? That's uh, Bebo, that's Coldy, that's X Copy, that's Ferocious. It's, you know, the, the that whole group of people all releasing work without the filter, right? It was just them and then one collector. And, you know, I, 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 on some level you see like, okay, the auctions go high and that's great. And therefore you, you know, there's some modicum of, there's some path or some interest happening here. But for me, like, my last 10 years had been almost entirely defined by eventually making multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars from a single job, but from something that I was not as present in. You know, I, I, I was doing this, but I, I was hardly in it. And that component of me was the far more compelling of the two things, that versus the money. So, you know, the, the way in which you can make money uh, is something that I've been contemplating for probably the first time in my life. Uh, and it took me a while. So I studied the space. The first year or so, I really was just watching people. I, I you know, it's this funny cast of characters, your, your D's, your Kazomo, your uh, Farouk, uh, Ovi, like all these people are just, you know, they were literally cartoon JPEGs at the time. Uh, and, I, I monitored all of it. Like my whole life has always been, I would say, like defined by being an observer in some, in some fashion. And I just was keeping notes while I was creating. I was also trying to make sense of what the space is. I didn't w just want to come in at the peak or the fervor of it because it's the thing happening here. I wanted to make sure that my first steps were careful and considered because this is. It was scary for me, quite frankly. Like I was leaving behind stability to try yeah, to be very, like, It's very exposing because yeah, there's nobody in the middle. It's not You're not being commissioned here. You're being commissioned by individuals saying, I like your art. It's hard. It's scary. Exactly. Exactly. And so it, it, it puts you in a position where you uh, both know that you have to do it because it is scary, 
And you also want to make sure you are as equipped to understand it so that it becomes not scary as possible. And in that process, I, of studying the space, one of the main things that I observed was there was all these auctions that would take place and they each told little stories because the blockchain is recording this ledger. There are these timestamps and names of the people that contribute into the auction. And it, it wasn't just the source, the artist and the destination the collector. There was this like symphony that sometimes that would occur along the way. And sometimes at the beginning, it would just be like a, a random person coming in on super rare and throwing a really low bid. In. And then maybe a few of the artist's friends would, they just wanted to like sign their name, just a little bit of like a co-sign saying, I'm with you. I support you. I don't think or know if I'm going to win this. If I do, awesome. But I just want to help throw some energy on this. And as you get towards the end of it, like real and raw human emotions actually start to enter uh, into the playing field, like feelings of possession uh, and ego and the the battles that sometimes would occur at the end of these things would be climactic crescendos to the whole auction. But there wasn't, as per my observation, anything happening with everyone in between that. They paid a gas fee and then it just, poof, they're gone, right? They, they, they are not remembered. And so in taking my first steps, I released three pieces, Birth of Lucy, Lullabies for Isaac, and First Sacrifice, which constituted Lucy Chapter One. And what I said is I have created a skull called the Blueprint Skull. And anyone that enters these auctions as gratitude for helping me take a leap when, quite frankly, right now I need as many people behind me as possible because I've been a coward my whole life hiding behind other people, that, <laughs> that if you are willing to give me even just a gas fee, a little bit of energy that... I'm not going to convert it back and whatever, send you back some ETH, uh, but I'll use the one thing that I have, the one variable that separates me, which is painting. And mm -hmm. I will make a derivative of this blueprint skull for whoever enters it. And that's where the skulls of Lucy were born. And so it began as kind of a, a thank you, a gratitude, a claim uh, to take something I had observed of this auction history that was unique to the blockchain, but try to handle it in a way that was not cynical or transactional, but rather uh, I, I kind of need you right now. And I will back up that emotion with my time and my labor and uh, my thought. Yeah, you're, and, you're showing how much you appreciate them. Look, thank you for playing a part in this, you know. Exactly, exactly. And so six months later, I in, in creating this concept, um, I had a, an amazing protocol engineer named Zach Cullen. He was the protocol engineer at Super Rare at the time. And he had never heard of this concept of using everyone in the auction before. And he thought it was a very sweet idea. And so he offered, when I knew very little about the space, to write my very first smart contract and to build a claim portal so that all the people that entered uh, on, onto the ledger could come in and once I finished them, could claim their scope. So uh, essentially, rather than like just airdrop them to people, uh, you did this intentionally for me. I now do this intentionally for you. Here's our digital handshake acknowledging that. And so they began as free gifts and nothing really happened with them. I kept moving. I started working on Lucy Chapter 2. And, and how was the reception what, for Lucy Chapter 1? It was, it was amazing. It blew my mind. It was, uh, you know, those first auctions were very dramatic, very frenetic. The three went to um, Victor, Anchor Drops, and then Kazomo collected my very first piece, Birth of Lucy, for 50 ETH, which at that point was October 21. So that was, uh, you know, getting towards the peak of last cycle. And it's funny to kind of be spinning everything back up as we watch <laughs> nature turn itself over. Um, and the decay of the last year is now fertile grounds again. But uh, I think there was something, you know, cause really set a lot of what has unfurled after that in motion. And also, your, before we move on with this, your style was so different to the other early artists, right? Because you were using this old master style, but in digital format, 
strikingly different to Xcopy, for example. It, to, to be frank, like I was a little concerned about it, you know, I, when I when I first got in there because this is all I've ever known. You know, I, I have a deep love and nostalgia for the technique that I was trained under, obviously. But you know, the same thing that uh, I, I would say points me to the old masters out of a desire to like honor something handmade in the past uh, it ha has always been. I just want to take the feeling or the values or the morals behind it and bring it digitally. I, I, I don't actually uh, care about it arbitrarily in nostalgia. I think there's, there's something beautiful and human about what took place at that period in time that's worth preserving in this moment while things are easier to create. So building all of these things up bit by bit and holding uh, the mistakes inside them as well as an enormous amount of time was the thing that I can't really even help. Like it, it, it has all of my strengths and flaws in it simultaneously. It has my fixation on detail, my fixation on um, colors and, and movement and uh, melodramatic emotions. It's got, it's got all of me. And, and in, for in digital it. art, it's so textured, right? That's the amazing thing is how the hell you get such texture from what is really a flat medium. Yeah. It's a bit building up mistakes. Mostly is, is just stacking them all on top of each other and uh, not trying to undo them along the way. I, and I think that that is very much echoes my, my life and my path is, uh, you know, when I look back at my commercial art career, a lot of it is online. You know, you can see some of my old clients, you can see these, I would say like odd and embarrassing jobs, but they're part of me. You know, like I, I, I have, I kind of hold them a little bit sacred as uh, funny little scars of making your way to eventually. Well, we're all the sum of our personal. stories. We're all the sum exactly. of our stories. We couldn't be ourselves without them. That's right. And, you know, you, you can sometimes wish that you had a slightly more elegant or poetic story, but uh, in the end, I think. It, it, Exactly what takes you there, whether it is, begins at a tech blog or not, is just, that's you. Uh, that's can't, right. can't help it. So we're into season two now of Lucy, and the skulls are now out. What's the next story, part of the story here? Yeah, so over the last two and a half years, Lucy has gone through five chapters. So that was Lucy chapter one. Skulls, two, three, four, and uh, the most recent was chapter five, which constituted the monument game, uh, which was uh, the largest project I created. And after spending a year creating the monument game, which was this intricate and elaborate one of one painting, an addition of 256, and an entire platform to be able to have the addition collectors come in and observe and leave uh, on-chain coordinates and preserve their, their thoughts and their feelings within the metadata of their edition and the monument game itself, all while competing to collect a Skull of Lucy uh, and have that competition be judged and deliberated on by the other skulls. Uh, that project was for me a manifestation, a culmination of the last couple of years of observing the space of, of these strange concentric circles that can form through social dynamics of the one of ones being the, like the heart, the center, the fire of what I'm doing. It's where the most time, the most um, energy and emotion is in the skulls of Lucy are uh, both people that were there for my very first steps or who have bought into it uh, as those things have moved and went from free gifts to, I think the most recent one sold for $250,000 and, you know, to, to have that group of people that covers a gamut of some of the spaces best, like those are my people. That is like my collection, to be honest, is I've collected people, uh, some of the best that I could possibly have near me. And many of them have become dear friends and advisors. And then you've got the players. And these are the people that are looking at that center with the one of one, but competing to be in the skulls and the council. And I think the, uh, the ethos 
of this decentralized network and being a part of this like undulating organism that is the market and it's uh, funny little emotions as people try to manipulate it or build within it has really dictated or, or I should I should at least say inspired a part of my art and a central part of Lucy that kind of exists at a plane separate from the imagery. It is, it is in these dynamics, these connections that you can find an on-chain transaction or timestamp to point to where an origination of a connection began. It's kind of like the log or ledger of it. It's a lot of like real human beings that have all started gravitating, getting rather close to one another as things have spiraled out. So when I think about the next steps, for me, it is what follows this design and what follows this design in a way that doesn't just create a larger outer rum to spread. Before and I would say like, to, before we go into that, clarify yeah. to people who aren't that familiar, how the hell the game works, because it sounds incredibly complex and somewhat daunting because you go in, there's a lot of kind of well-known people. There's the skulls, there's this beautiful piece of art. Sure. There's some way you need to be involved in the coordinates competing for some. Talk us through that. You know, what, what was this madscape that went through your mind to say, this is what I'm going to put down and this is what it is before we go on to where we're going. Definitely. So the monument game is one massive painting. I spent a year creating this and it is basically my exertion of the many intertwining and overlapping paths that one can take in life. Uh, the moment they exit isolation and want to connect themselves to the broader network that is humanity. Uh, and this is where you can grow, where you can learn, where you can stumble and fail, uh, and where you can get lost and wander along the way. But in, in this work, I wanted to make this dense and complex scene filled with hundreds of little stories from both my own life and life that I've observed. But I felt when I go to a museum and I see a very large work, just because it's large doesn't mean that I have an intimate relationship with it. Just because it's complex doesn't mean I have an intimate relationship with it. But digital, for all the bad things about it, where it can be this kind of dissociative place where you're swiping through, you're scrolling past, as most people, and certainly you know, it's also an incredible and infinite rabbit hole when you have a thing that you really want to get down into. And it is actually an incredibly intimate experience. And so I, in creating it, I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to create this image, imagery is only one part of this artwork. The people that I would like to congregate around it and leave a piece of themselves behind within it require a system around it. And so basically you have this painting, but then you also have a viewer to zoom, pan, get as close to it as humanly possible, look through every little detail. But then you also have a game, an incentive structure. And this to me is something that I have come to over the last couple of years of being in this space and getting to know many of the people, uh, both in the council as well as just in crypto in general, is there's a lot of really brilliant, really thoughtful, really soulful people, people that, that love art, that want to be, uh, I would say, like closer to beauty and truth, but also are in this for lack of a better term, the devil's casino. <laughs> and they... <laughs> yeah, but they love it, gamification. I mean, it's part of the they, space. They love it. It's, it's not a, it's not a judgment I mean, two call. parts of the, the key space parts of the slides. space of people and gamification. Those are two core factors that kind of are everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. And I think rather than viewing the gamified bits of this, the the... Uh, casino aspects of it as purely some kind of terrible thing, I actually see it as it's actually a beautiful place to meet people at and to say, uh, there is something in here that you know how to do that I don't really understand anything about, but you're having fun and go, go at it. Go, go bonk your life away. I, 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 I'm enjoying the show. Um, and instead see that as that bonk, that shit coin. <laughs> Uh, whatever it may be, is has a path to actually becoming 
the beginning fertilizer of a digital art renaissance. And that there is a pathway through meme coins, through the coins themselves, through PFPs, through art that is, is not to be judged or looked down upon, but is actually to say, what can you put forward that I personally treasure or view as sacred or beautiful in the world that looks at those people and says, I want you to come closer. I want you to look at this thing that I spend a year of my life putting all of these little stories into all of my soul, all of my heart into uh, all of my failures into. And I want you to come as close to it as possible. And I want you to do that, not to worship it like an altar, but rather treat, rather treat it as a mirror and write with a rather crude tool, which is your own words, something like a fairly long tweet and preserve at a time scale that will last as long as this piece lasts on chain, what you want to leave behind. And to ask that of someone, not just their money to collect the addition, but their thought, their time, their words, and the like responsibility or duty around it meant for me, I'm in a market, right? I'm, I'm not just creating paintings for the beauty of the world. And it's, I'm in a total bubble separate from the network, meet people where they're at. And so with the concentric circles that I built of the one of ones, the heart, the story, the skulls of Lucy, which are outside of that and now the players, I'm of a belief that if you are to build concentrically outwards, you have to do it like a seashell. You know, like if you are spiraling outwards, you have to create strength and bonds as you begin that, because as it gets wider and wider, the it becomes more brittle. And if you expand too fast, it actually is faster to become worth nothing or to completely fall Because you apart. lose the intimacy of what you've created, right? Right now, it's very intimate. And if you expand yes. too fast, it's gone. Yes. And, and uh, the I would say the social component of Lucy is really testing out how do I, how do I grow this in a way that doesn't lose that intimacy? And so one of the things was to have those, that outer circle of the players, the additions, those who are leaving observations, leave observations on top of a one of them. So they are, they're essentially honoring or looking or analyzing, uh, within a work that only one person, in this case, Ryan Zur over at one of one works could collect. And then. To incentivize that behavior, the skulls of Lucy or the council, uh, which are all of the collectors closest around me, I had three remaining and I put them up as the rewards as judged by the other skull holders. So my existing collectors to say, who has given of themselves? Like who, who has really left a piece of themselves behind, uh, and taken this seriously and to then take their words as valuable as something that means something that, that isn't just you know, a tweet into the void, but that uh, I'm going to hold those things as sacred. And even the contract we built for when uh, the three individuals won the game was to say, I will give you this skull of Lucy if you give me your player edition with the words that you wrote, and I will hold on to those. And I'm never going to sell those. Those are mine. I, this is our fair trade. And so even though the edition cost $5,500 and the skull of Lucy at the time was selling for a hundred and 150. We just broke that this week, but that's an outlier. It's to say that, you know, do the, do the Charlie and the chocolate factory competition, you know, to f find your way to move up a rung, uh, separate from what you began at, but don't see it as something that what you contributed is less in value because I actually viewed the time and effort that many of those people that played the monument game as more than most people have given me uh, in my whole life. Like the, the amount of thought and care and energy that is in some of these observations that stay with the provenance of this piece for as long as it exists uh, is unreal. People dumped out their, their traumas, their uh, letters to their children, confessions to their brothers. There's some beautiful, beautiful, crazy things as well as some, Disturbing things, but you know you you got to you got to take all of human humanity. It's a jungle out there. So then, where does the monument game go? When is it won, and what is the next phase? What happens to the council? Where, 
you know, where's the expansion here that you were talking about? Yeah. So the, the, the monument game has been won. The three people won the, their skull of Lucy. Uh, and the future of the monument game for me goes in two directions. The first direction is how it is exhibited in the world, right? Our, our bubble of digital art uh, and NFTs is, is small. It's, it's incredible and it's passionate and it's uh, kind of hard, honestly, to engage with other parts of the world because I've fully, you know, been pilled on it and am truly immersed inside it. It is my whole existence. Uh, and yet at the same time, there's a whole other world of people that haven't discovered it yet. And much like with the creation of the monument game of acknowledging the casino and meeting people where they're at, I think so too, if I'm going to take this project, I have to meet people where they're at. But the second path really for me is just the path of Lucy and really just the path of how I see what can be done with this technology, which is to say the space between myself and a collector is the closest it has ever been in history. The space between a collector and another collector is the closest that it has been in history. So too with the viewer. How do you take that closeness, the, the reduction of space between each increment and a network and make sure that those that give you fire and fervor to take this, this beautiful gift of being able to go out on my own, essentially create monkey paintings and, uh, you know, have a beautiful life in it that I get to share with my wife and amazing friends and collectors around me. Uh, how do you just not like discard and dispose that? Because I know who they are and I know how close they are and I know exactly when they enter in my life. And so the future of the monument game is to take all of those players. And as we go into chapter six, to just bring them with us and essentially to say, my life here is being handled episodically. I'm released chapter one, three paintings, chapter two, one painting, chapter three, and so on. With each one, I'm learning and I am both succeeding and failing, but I'm trying to learn from each one of the steps. If you want to be along for the ride and see what this is about, I will do my damnedest to not squander the gift that has been given. And for most people, I think just knowing that you care and you want to improve yourself is enough to bet on. Like that, you know, most of the people around me, it's not like, you know, they, the council isn't a bunch of guys that all need to be a part of some secret club or cult. You know, they're all lone wolves. They're all successful people for the most part. They don't, they, that's not really the thing that they're after right now. A lot of this is just saying, keep going. And it, you know, in a rather significant way. And I see it, uh, it, if, if I were to view any relationship that an artist could or should have with a collector, it, it should be to say, you don't owe them anything, but you do owe yourself to not squander the gift to keep going. There's also something I've been thinking about. I was, as you do on uh, OpenSea, I was buying an X copy, and I was Beautiful. just scrolling through the ownership. And there's a story to be told. Yeah, there's something in that that I was just going through that, thinking there's a story here that's not being told. You know, why did Pranksy? Why was he the first person to buy this? And why did he sell it? And who did he sell it to? And what was the story and what was going on? Anyway, it was just a side. When you were talking about this, I'm thinking there's a lot of stories to be told that the chain actually records, but the stories aren't expanded on yet. Exactly. And I think that, you know, our space getting more sophisticated, there are, I know a number of people that are working on trying to record the story, you know, not just the the data, the transaction, but record the story. And you know, as the skulls have moved, each one kind of has its own funny story. Like the just tribe. today, this this happened maybe an hour ago. I don't know when what we're doing is going live, but uh, Zach, that protocol engineer that helped me create the very first contract, you know, 
we had had a chat way back, you know, back when skulls were selling for maybe like 30,000. I was like, look, man, if this is ever at a place, just understand, I don't know where any of this would have gone if you hadn't given me your knowledge or skill set right out of the gate. Um, I, I will never judge you. I'm, I will never feel a sense of like, whatever, betrayal or loss if you ever sell this thing. If it does something meaningful for you to propel you at a certain moment in life, like, please, like that is nature's design. Like it requires movement. It requires turnover. And so uh, at the same event that I, I, I met you at, I met uh, Beauty and Punk. And uh, she's, she's an amazing collector. And we spent some time in Paris and she wanted to join the council, but she wanted to do it in an unusual way. And so she is trading her punk and some ETH for his skull. And so that, that happened like an hour ago. And so oh, wow. you know, that, that to me is like, she has this whole story, these branching paths in the crypto punk community. Uh, she is as, you know, has been kind of like a mythic figure in the background, just whispered about as very kindly, fondly by most people in the space. But then to finally just like cross real life paths and to see both someone that supported me from the get go be rewarded with something as well as have someone beautiful new come in and be able to share this in unison. It's kind of the, like, I, it's so much more interesting than just anonymously collecting things and anonymously collecting the money from those things. Here's a question for you. I've been thinking about ever since that event, when we were all together is clearly there is a, movement towards the physical world um you know you're talking about it dimitri's obviously doing it um rafiq kind of did it in digital format but in such a kind of oh my god way obviously beeple's done it uh ack's done it and you can see it's happening everywhere and i think the movement is because our world of the digital art space is still really for only people from crypto. You know, it's it's the it's the it's the people of that world who are the patrons, the collectors, it's all of that. And the trad world, there's not very few. There's sure there's Alan Howard and there's a few, but there's very but Alan's really a digital guy anyway. And there's this definite movement. Talk me through that movement, because I there's a fear within it that it's all going to get subsumed by the trad art money world mystique because there's a there's a certain there's a fear within me that people are going to look to that world for some sort of confirmation some sort of you know well done you're meaningful when the real meaning is in the revolution you've all guys have just started and there's something i walked away from that very a, a duality of thoughts around it thinking yeah we could lose everybody to this because that law of Sotheby's, Christie's, museums is so alluring that we lose the essence. Well, how, how do you think of that? I don't have the same fear, mostly because I think what is being created here is so compelling and so interesting and is a just far broader tool set. Like take, take the monument game, right? It's if, if it existed just in the, trad art world it's a painting on a wall and it's static right and and okay you know let's even just take and make it digital and let's say i animated it and suddenly it's moving right to me that's the least interesting thing that could be done with digital art all of these social dynamics these communal dynamics these participatory dynamics like look at what we're doing right now it is the most incredible thing the space between where i am and you are has been fully closed right? There's, there's only one step further that can go of seeing each other in person. But right now we are about as close as we could possibly be. And that is only going to get closer over time. So lifting up, I think things that once were abstracted or intangible, connecting each element of the network as part of the art, right? It is, it's not a, a tertiary thing. It's not just your art market. It actually is central and woven into uh, just as much of a pillar as the imagery itself is something that it may take the trad art market a very long time to come this way. 
if you're thinking about it as pure binary, but I see it more as if you build compelling things that are, that demonstrate the power, much like all things in life and all things throughout history, the most curious will find their way. And it's not a matter of having like just the right conversation with a trad art collector to convince or evangelize them that, you know, you should start buying digital art. It, my, my personal quest is not to dismiss the trad art world like we're in some kind of purely punk digital revolution. There's a lot that was created on a curatorial sense that this space dismissed three years ago and then has slowly been coming to all the same revelations that were already in place by auction houses and galleries and things like that. So it is to say there's a lot of learning that the space can can take from them. You don't need to utterly discard it. You just also don't need to bend it to that. If, if I'm going to continue Lucy, it should be in a way, and it will be in a way, that is home. This is where I build my story. Right. And, and, and whatever I create in and outside of Lucy will all be expressions of my soul, soul that are removed from trying to cater to some kind of like existing old guard. It's just to say, you do need to ride out and meet them. Right. You do need to be like, this is what's happening over here. If you are not curious enough, if you are not interested enough, oh, that's fine. All of these things have a, a, an odd way of eventually rippling in the right direction. I first heard of Bitcoin over 10 years ago, right? You know, and, and it seemed absolute nonsense to me at the time. And I was cynical and skeptical about it most of the time because the first time I ever saw it being used was to purchase drugs. Like, you know, my friend buying Modafinil. Like it is, it, it was not something that I saw as like profound. And yet if I was actually paying attention and if I knew a little history, I would actually view that little glimmer I was seeing right there through that drug purchase as something rather profound. And what is begin to, to unfurl in, in our world, and uh, certainly as the chain gets used by more, more and more people, I, I can't really imagine a scenario where the whole world isn't operating on it personally. And so let them come in time. I, I don't think there's a rush. I, I even like look at the last cycle where certain bits of our space were tried to be inserted through like blunt force and price action into the trad art market. It was largely rejected. Not entirely. There's a few outliers and exceptions. But it was largely rejected. But much like you talk about a lot, you know, most forward progress is not like week to week or even season to season. It is these lessons learned through growth and decay cycles. And these, these things that get separated out each one, these like rhyming lessons or values that seem to repeat themselves over time that you can use if you study them enough as you head into the next one. I think as we head into, I guess, what would be considered the second NFT cycle right now, uh, just knowing that there's a second one, I think will profoundly change how people come to respect this space rather than seeing it as something that's going to be co-opted and taken from Yeah, us. because people will see that this is non-cyclical. We're not talking price here. We're talking about movement, momentum, meaning. It's, it's not cyclical. Well, it is cyclical, but it's in a secular uptrend. So yeah. each phase moves further on than the next. So as you rightly say, people have only seen it once. They're like, was this a flash in the pan? Was this a moment of madness? What was interesting? Surely these people are just going to grow up and come to the normal art world or whatever it is, right? Or go back to being graphic designers. But I think they'll see this time around that, oh, okay, there's something bigger and it's more meaningful. And as the space also has more capital in it, as it creates so much wealth, it creates new opportunities, brings new artists into the space and new mediums. And I think that's going to be interesting. That's a question I want to ask you as well. Uh, so if you're thinking about Lucy and the world that you've created, how are you thinking about new mediums? Because the mediums are changing so fast too. You know, the mediums of whether it's AI or whether it's the 3D medium 
that is immersive AR going into VR. How do you think about that? Is it something that's it- in your curiosity set? Or is it like, no, I'm kind of, this is who I am, and I'm happy with that? And that's, there's no right or wrong answer. You totally. Uh, most of what my time butting up against this space has revealed to me is this is the first time in my life I've collided with people that are not just artists, right? Uh, you, you have protocol engineers, financiers, poker players. You have, That's why I love uh, it. Builders you never company. get exactly. these people around a dinner party, and it's incredible when you do. It's 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 a bizarre situation where you you really get many different, you know, to bring it back to the first drawing class, like many different angles of light, all bouncing in a common direction. And it is illuminated in a way that it is just not if it's just you and butting up against this, I would say, futurist space, this thing that is looking towards the future, uh, I see some of my role as trying to not let it slip so out of control that we forget what it is to be human and forget what is important about the past along the way. But I also see it as this is, humanity is, is rarely kind to those that bury their heads in the sand. And these things that are growing, expanding at a rapid rate are there to be studied and learned from. And as you connect to a network, my personal thesis is I believe the thing that will make us whole as the space shrinks between each, each of us is if we are the rawest version, the most potential of ourselves realized version pushed out within that network. And so what that requires is being vulnerable, preserving your flaws, exerting your strengths, and uh, trying to not get subsumed by the ease and access of the tools, but more so seeing can you, your, your individual identity, much as it is on the transactions on chain, be concrete, preserved. This is you. This is exactly the origin point of an artwork. This is the exact origin point of a collection. So too, if we are talking about AI, for example, can myself, Sam, if I were to ever mess with these tools, be maintained within it? And I think when I, when I look at the future of those tools, I think they are already changing the world as far as on, on a retail level of mid journey or Dolly or anything like that. But I think what many artists that ha- haven't gone through the process of uh, honing a craft will bump into is if, if their flaws butting up against their strengths is not present in there. I, I always say like, you can find me in the flaws of my work. Like I, I am there. I am not in the best version of it. I am very much in the trying to be the best version of it. And here are the ways in which I am struggling that you can see inside it. And so in handling AI, I think that great work will get made with it that preserves that individual humanity. I think that if it is just a replication of the hive mind, if you say, then it, it's for everyone and therefore no one. It, it demands the thing that you are struggling most with. And I, you know, I, as I begin and experiment with all of these tools, whether or not they, they find their way in is going to be entirely contingent on whether or not I'm still there. And not just it's stylistically inter- there, but systemically there. I've been playing around because somebody reached out to me and said, hey, listen, we'd love to train a, a RAL bot. And I'm like, okay, let's give this a go. Really interesting. So what they trained it on was my Twitter feed, all the free YouTubes out there. So nothing behind a paywall. And then, so that was the first iteration. I'm like, it's not bad. Then it now speaks in my voice. So I speak to myself, which is weird. And then what I did was I gave it encyclopedic knowledge. So I gave it the books that were important to me, including wine history books and music and stuff. And I gave it all the background, plus all the finance books and all this stuff. And it starts to piece together some sort of 
characterization of who you are. Now, it's not perfect yet. It's early days, but it's kind of startling because you can actually create some of the elements of yourself. Now, I was thinking that through. It's like, okay, Apple or somebody is going to have a on-device AI that sees everything you see, hears every conversation you hear, and helps you in that. It'll see every tweet you've ever read, every YouTube, every phone conversation, everything. Now, how different is that from you? Does it get the emotions that you get from it because it sees how you react? It's just going to be very interesting where I don't know whether we cross over that boundary you're talking about between it just being this flat digital thing, the hive mind, everything and nothing, or whether it actually becomes us and ourselves. I I can see it branching in all directions, but I'd say at least at its current epoch, uh, that, that, that it's at. I don't know about you, but using chat GPT has helped me ask better questions because I've realized how stupid it is if I don't, that it, it has unbelievable power, but it really is reliant on you going back and forth with it. And, and to me, that is obvious almost like, right? You know, you go back thousands of years to like the Talmud, you know, the Talmud is, you know, you're taking the Old Testament, you're going line by line, and uh, there is Midrash, there is a multi-century discourse between rabbis and scholars arguing and debating over what something means. And leaving that conversation teaches you uh, as a student of it, how to ask a better question. And I think so too, with these tools, much like wanting to leave your flaws inside, uh, say a piece of work, if it is assisted with AI in some way, that getting to see them as they will only be as great as you are. It, they, 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 they are not actually quite as supplementary, uh, in a way of like they, they become you, but it, it's to say that like you, you have to almost clone them to be the perfect recall version of your most curious and active and growing self. Because if you get lazy with it, it will be lazy too. It's super interesting. So what's the next step? This year will be filled with Lucy chapter six, which is uh, a couple of branching directions, but it is nonetheless something that I... I am playing with tools that I have never played with. I am pushing uh, my craft in a way that I never have. Uh, I am building the communal and social elements around it in a way that I hope uh, demands more of people, like makes them compete with a greater fervor uh, and brings out a little bit more darkness, uh, ideally as well. Sam, listen, thank you for everything you do in this space. Thank you for pushing boundaries and... uh will be following you very closely in this next journey to see where it all goes as well. Thank you, Will. It's, uh, you know, I got to say, uh, before we go, there was something about when, when we were all together and you, this was, you know, early January. And so you're giving this articulation of what you see coming in the market, in the world and life. And, as a, you know, there, there's this moment where you are both taking in what you are trying to pass on and, and convey to me, to the audience, as well as a moment for me of observing the observers and just looking at the room of people and how they're taking in what you're saying. And it was really interesting because the sense I got was even though that room I would define as like a fairly successful room of people, I think they were all pretty stark. Like, I think everyone had been brutalized in some way. They had made some misstep, even with holding that successful title. And the things you were saying were so bullish, if you will, (laughs) that it, there was a moment of fear and terror of like, what is this guy selling? You know, I've seen his YouTube videos and he's got the fire behind him and the Bitcoins and the big grin. Like, what is he, what, what, what kind of like, you know, fool's errand am I on right here? But it, it's like, as you s- walked through it, you got to see this like light and everyone's eyes begin to change as they started to get out of the zone of thinking 
I'm being fed Kool-Aid. And in fact, I'm being fed wisdom. I'm being fed someone who has watched the cycles unfold. And when I look at the months that have followed since, we're back. <laughs> and also, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in that presentation, because I know how artists are, they always think it's their fault. My art's not selling. My prices are miserable. Yep. Everybody hates me. I'm just a flash in the pan. Right. And I know what that is. And I could see it in everybody's face. And the moment I validated everybody by saying, well, here's all of the price charts of all of you. You're pretty much correlated. You sell at different prices because you have different demand structures. And it's all driven by something out of your control. Everyone's like, thank you. <laughs> and that thing that's out of your control is looking quite positive. Everyone was like, oh, thank you. Hey, that was a, There was a real sense of relief, I think, from that. Because everyone had this little feeling inside, that little inner child, which is like, maybe I just told myself a story that wasn't true about myself. And that's what I saw. And almost everybody, without exception, came up and thanked me because it wasn't about because I was bullish. It's because I validated their experience of, I feel like it's me. And it's like, no, it's not you. It's okay. We all wanted to know that the story we were telling ourselves was a communal and collective one. And I think they did accomplish that. Yeah. Brilliant, my friend. Great to see you. And we'll catch up again soon. So hopefully somewhere in the world soon as well in person. That'd be lovely. Good seeing Thank you. Care. Thank you so much for having me. So look, I really enjoyed that conversation. Sam is a lovely human being, amazing artist. He thinks about things in ways that others haven't yet. He's one of these pioneers of the space, pushing boundaries, pushing himself, and even pushing the collectors. I love the way that he's creating networks and connections and stories within stories, within the art itself. And that's really magical. He's a magical storyteller at heart. And you know, very kindly, we spoke at the end about the presentation that I'd given at uh, People Studios. That's the same presentation that was on the crypto gathering. So the link's below if you're going to watch that, because I think it's a very important space. And it was really nice to hear from me, the validation to me, that actually it resonated with you know, some of these amazing greats. They were like, okay, this was really useful. So that's my piece about NFTs, how they're macro. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. If you're interested in NFTs, you certainly will. And check out the rest of the content from the Crypto Gathering. Anyway, the link to that piece is below. Also, make sure you watch the Beeple interview as well. That was a hell of a lot of fun, um, but also some really profound insights. Anyway, take care. See you next time. Hi. On June 5th and 6th, 2024, I'll be speaking at the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore, at the iconic Marina Bay Sands. Alongside brilliant minds like Benedict Evans, Balaji, and Edward Snowden, I'll be on stage exploring the extraordinary potential of AI and the profound change it represents, not just for financial markets, but for the world as we know it. With over 5,000 attendees and over 150 side events, Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June the 3rd to the 9th. Visit realvision.com forward slash super AI to register and join me with 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION, all in caps. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.